Hi guys, I'm Dr. Errol Ozdaga. I'm a Stanford doc as well as a hospitalist and a member of the Stanford Medicine 25. The purpose of this video is talk about the approach to your patient with aortic regurgitation. My purpose for this video by the end of it is that you become an expert in the approach to aortic regurgitation. We're going to go through inspection and palpation, followed by auscultation. Next we'll look at the associated clinical exam findings you see in a patient with aortic regurgitation. We'll want to look for signs of heart failure, and of course we'll finish by talking about the causes and the associated clinical findings. So to start off with inspection and palpation, I'm going to jump to his right side. For this, we're basically looking at the point of maximal impulse, or the PMI. To do that, we either inspect or we palpate in this region. It's best done by having the patient sitting up, leaning forward, or in the left lateral decubitus position to bring the heart closer to the chest wall and it's normally found in intercostal space 5, midclavicular, right, above, right below where the nipple is. You can start by palpating with your fingers or if you want to start with your full palm to try to palpate where it is. Patients with aortic regurgitation can develop in a large dilated heart, in which case you'll see the PMI displaced inferior, inferiorly and laterally. Lastly, be sure to feel above the sternal notch and also the right intercostal space. If you feel big pulsations here, that might be aortic regurgitation caused from an aortic aneurysm. So for the exam of aortic regurgitation, the most important part is auscultation. For auscultation, we want to listen at the left lower sternal border and listen for a decrescendo blowing murmur. As a side note, whenever you're listening to murmurs, try to palpate one of the arteries, whether it's the radial artery, brachial artery, subclavian artery, or carotid artery. That way you can tell if the murmur is a systolic or diastolic murmur. Since you can't palpate his arteries, we put these sticks here so you can see when his heart is contracting in systole. The murmur of aortic regurgitation is best heard when the patient is leaning forward and during end expiration to bring the heart closer to the chest wall. Be sure to make sure your patient doesn't bear down if you're asking him to expire because that might cause a Valsalva maneuver and decrease blood flow to the heart, which could actually lower your murmur. So as I place my stethoscope at the left lower sternal border around intercostal space three or four, and I see the stick move, I hear a murmur when the stick has, after the stick is moved. So as I put my stethoscope at the left lower sternal border around intercostal space three and four, I hear a murmur that occurs after the stick moves or after systole. It's occurring during diastole. Another murmur you'll commonly hear is a systolic outflow murmur due to the high flow coming out the aortic valve. And of course, just like in any murmur, you'll hear it best in the aortic region at the right upper stone border. That should be occurring during systole. It can be sometimes hard to appreciate with the diastol diastolic murmur occurring. And generally speaking, it should not be as loud as the diastolic murmur. it's louder on the right side, it may suggest an aortic aneurysm causing the aortic regurgitation. Same thing on that right upper stonal border, border. So right border suggests aortic aneurysm. One thing you might want to look for is the Austin Flint murmur. The Austin Flint murmur is believed to be caused from the downward jet of the aortic regurgitation murmur pressing on the mitral valve, which causes a functional mitral stenosis. Just like mitral stenosis, the best way to listen for that is to have your patient in the left lateral decubitus position, your stethoscope on the bell setting, and listen in the mitral region right around the apex or the intercostal space 5, midclavicular. So as part of your auscultation exam for aortic regurgitation, one thing you can consider doing is a cardiac maneuver. There's lots of maneuvers out there. Probably the best one for aortic regurgitation is the isometric hand grip because it increases afterload it'll make the pressure of pushing the, the regurgitant murmur back much louder. So it'll increase your aortic regurg murmur. Mr. Guns, great, thank you. Good. And we'll take a listen here. So moving on to other findings in aortic regurgitation, there can be a lot of neat things that you may or may not see in a patient with aortic regurgitation. Most of it's caused from the large amount of blood flowing out and back into the heart. One of those is called Corrigan's Pulse, and this patient 
has it here. If you look at his carotid arteries, you'll see a bounding pulse. You can see it here and here. That's simply from the increased amount of blood flow coming out and going back into the heart. Along with the Corrigan's pulse, you have the Watson's water hammer pulse, which is essentially a visualization of the same thing in the carotids, but either at the brachial, radial, or ulnar arteries. In here. You actually can see it in the ulnar artery here. Oftentimes it's accentuated as you lift the arm up more. You can also palpate for the water hammer pulse by putting your palm over the radial and ulnar arteries, lifting the arm up. You can feel the bounding pulse against the palm of your hand. Along with those findings, there's a ton of other clinical findings, all caused from the increased blood flow going back and forth through the arteries. To learn more of those, visit the Stanford 25 site. So now that you've confidently diagnosed your patient with aortic regurgitation, it's really important to evaluate for heart failure, both diastolic and systolic heart failure. For diastolic heart failure, be sure to look at the lungs for Rawls, look at the lower extremity edema and dependent areas for edema, as well as look for systolic heart failure. Look for a gal an S3 gout that you may see in dilated cardiomyopathy. Look for peripheral cyanosis or cold, clammy hands because of systolic outflow being decreased. And finally, be sure to look at the blood pressure. In aortic regurgitation, the pulse pressure should be very high. If the pulse pressure isn't high or decreases, it could be a sign of systolic heart failure. Another thing to consider is the cause of aortic regurgitation. There's lots of causes there, most of which can be found on our website. But a couple things to mention, because they have some interesting clinical findings you want to look for, include endocarditis, looking for splinter hemorrhages, Ozer nodes, January lesions, and maybe even Roth spots in the retina exam. Although much more rare now, syphilis can cause an infective aortitis. So look for signs mentioned earlier of ascending aortic aneurysm from syphilis or any other cause. Genetic diseases such as Marfan syndrome, patients who are tall with long limbs, arachnodactyly with a positive thumb or wrist sign. Aortic dissection, patients with chest pain radiating to the back. Look for pulse deficits where there's a pulse present on one side and not present on the other or delayed on the other. Consider checking the blood pressure in both arms to make sure they aren't different. Rheumatic heart disease, really more common in underdeveloped countries. Patients often present also with mitral involvement, usually mitral regurgitation. Chronic and severe hypertension. Look for things like cotton wool spots or hemorrhages on the retinal exam. And again, find a full list of causes on the Stanford 25 website. So be sure to visit our Stanford 25 page on aortic regurgitation that has a lot more information, as well as things we didn't cover here, including the evidence base for different parts of the exam. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.